Welcome to... Thank you. Please stand by. Please state your name after the tone, then press pound. You will now be placed into conference. Joined. Well, I can put it right here. Is she okay for it? Okay, so I have started the meeting. We have done our land acknowledgement. I'm just going to confirm with the director or trustee officer uh, we aren't able to play the anthem tonight. We can, yes. Okay, I'm having trouble hearing you, um, but if we can go ahead and play O Canada. At this time, um, please go ahead. coming in, um, so we've gotten started, and I'll move on to our meeting roll call. As we get to the roll call, I'll just remind everyone for our virtual meeting norms, um, please make sure that you're on mute if you're not speaking. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties uh, for trustees, can you please text our trustee officer, Trustee Officer Miller, um, to let her know. And, of course, we want to always be respectful um, as we're engaging in important dialogue tonight. I'll, for the roll call, I do have regrets from Trustees Archer and Trustee Pekin Miller going through the rest of the list. Trustee Bingham, are you present? Joined. Present. Thank you. Trustee Buck? Present. Thank you. Trustee Deese? Present. Thank are you, you Trustee Galindo? Left. Sorry, present. Trustee Galindo? Thank you. Trustee Johnston? Trustee Johnston, are you on the line? Trustee Miller, are you present? Joined. I'm present, thank you. Thank you. Trustee Mulholland? Joined. Present. Thank you. Trustee Tut? Present, thank you. Thank you. Student Trustee Mahmoud? Student Trustee Aisha Mahmood. Thought I heard her on, but maybe she's having some technical difficulties. Student Trustee Abdel Hafiz. Joined. Let's try again. Student Trustee Abdel Hafiz. Okay, and Sigawan Galvardot Kaji. Present. Thank you. Uh, I believe, Trustee Johnstone, you've joined? Present. Thank you. And I'll just uh, check one more time. We've had a few people join in. Student Trustee McLeod? Left. And I'll try Student Trustee Abdel Hafiz. Okay, not hearing 
So student trustees at this time. Thank you. At this time, I'm looking for approval of the agenda. So I'll have that moved by Trustee Bingham, seconded by Trustee Buck. Uh, are there any amendments or issues with the agenda? And I'll remind everyone if, if uh, we don't go through the roll call, you can unmute yourself and jump in. Otherwise, um, for any voting on an action item, I'll make sure I go through the roll call. Uh, hearing none, uh, Aisha, is anyone joined? Free? Welcome, student trustee McCoy. Aisha, left. Have you? Oh. Joined. Uh, just making sure, that, is anyone opposed to approval of the agenda? Hearing none, uh, item five is declarations of conflict of interest. Do we have any declarations? Hearing none, we'll move to reports from staff. Item six is our immunization disclosure and testing requirements update and discussion. So there isn't a report, but trustees will note that there is a presentation that was sent out uh, that you ha should have in your email. So I'll invite you to open that, and I'll turn it over to the director. Thank you. Through the chair, um, I want to begin by stating that this presentation is also linked, Joined. linked to our website so that the public can also access. And I want to first acknowledge um, the hard work of staff, but especially our human resources um, division, who have been working uh, very hard and, and countless hours on implementation of the immunization disclosure and testing requirements since it was announced in mid-August. Trustees will see a revised uh, presentation that was sent later on this afternoon by Trustee Officer Heather Miller. And at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Superintendent Jamie Nunn, who will provide an update on the background, again, um, to set the context, the rationale um, for this immunization disclosure, in addition, the attestation requirements, and more importantly, our response rate to date from our staff, which has been uh, very positive, uh, but then to unpack sort of um, the responses we have not received to date and sort of what are our next steps uh, uh, with communication to the community and the ministry requirements around public communication regarding our rates. So at this point, I'll pass it over to Superintendent Nunn. Uh, thank you, Director Figueredo and through the chair. On behalf of Executive Council and the Human Resource Services staff, i bring forth a presentation this evening to walk uh, the Board of Trustees through our immunization disclosure uh, requirements as set out uh, by the Ministry of Education and also the Chief Medical Officer of Health. I'll bring trustees to slide two to help set a context for tonight's presentation. And it was here that on August the 17th, so the Chief Medical Officer of Health announced the requirement for an immunization disclosure policy uh, would be required for all publicly funded school board employees, staff in private schools and licensed child care settings, and other individuals who, fre who frequently attend settings and may have direct contact with both students and or staff for the duration of the 2021-2022 school year. We received further direction from the Ministry and also from the Chief Medical Officer of Health that we're, we were required to have a policy in place uh, and fully implement it by September 27th of this month. Within the disclosure policy, um, it outlines clearly that staff needed to identify whether they have been fully vaccinated uh, for COVID, against COVID-19, and if they are not fully vaccinated against COVID-19, they are to participate in regular rapid antigen testing requirements um, uh, during this time. Individuals who, are not, who do not intend to be vaccinated without a documented medical reason would be required to further participate in an educational session about the benefits of the actual vaccination. And I'll walk trustees through uh, parts of that uh, in the presentation. I'll take trustees to slide three, and slide three highlights the rationale uh, of the Chief Medical Officer for why uh, they have introduced the necessity to have a immunization disclosure policy in Ontario school boards and within HWDSB. We know that achieving high immunization rates in Ontario schools through vaccination 
is a part of a range of measures and actions that will help prevent and limit the spread of COVID-19 in schools and further support our goal of keeping schools open and safe for in-person learning. The Chief Medical Officer has outlined for school boards that the objective of such a policy will support safer schools for Ontario students, set out provincially consistent approach to COVID-19 immunization disclosure within and across all school boards, uh, optimize our vaccination rates in, uh, within schools, ensure that individuals have access to information required to make informed decisions, and ensure that individuals who have not yet been vaccinated for COVID-19 are being routinely tested uh, for COVID-19. I'll take trustees to slide four and walk, uh, walk trustees through uh, the steps that we've taken uh, within Human Resource Services uh, with our staff. And it was here that by uh, September 7th of last week, all HWDSB staff were expected to submit a formal attestation and identify if they've been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 and provide proof of full vaccination uh, or uh, disclose that, they've been, that they are unvaccinated. Now, by definition, fully vaccinated is defined as ha an individual having received all of the doses required for COVID-19 vaccine approved by the World Health Organization and having received their final dose at least 14 days uh, prior. Staff within HWDSB um, had a week or so to be able to disclose uh, and attest uh, to their disclosure to their status. And staff who are unvaccinated identified the reason for their disclosure, including uh, a medical reason, a uh, human rights reason, uh, or uh, personal. HWDSB staff who are not fully vaccinated um, can continue to submit their attestation to the school year. We know that there are staff who currently have received one dose uh, of the vaccine and are slated to uh, receive a second dose of the vaccine, uh, and they are able to uh, continue to disclose and up, uh, um, update their information uh, to the point that they've now been fully uh, to the point that they are defined as being fully vaccinated. Until this time, staff who are not fully vaccinated for COVID-19 would be required, uh, are required to participate in rapid testing. And, of, and uh, appreciating the timelines that have been set out, all newly hired staff or staff who may be returning from a leave uh, are required to attest to and disclose their vaccination status uh, on or before the first day they attend to a board site. So let's take a look at our response rate. On slide five, um, I've highlighted, as the director had indicated, we are very pleased um, with the response rate from staff. HWDSB currently has 7,581 permanent employees, occasional employees, and trustees. Of the 7,581, we currently have 7,251 staff, so that is permanent employees, occasional employees, and trustees who are actively working within the school board. As of Friday of last week, so September the 10th, when we pulled our data at one o'clock, um, we had 6,614 employees, or 91% of staff who are actively working disclose, disclose their vaccination status. Um, further, um, from our data poll, we have six, uh, 637 employees, roughly 9%, who have not disclosed their vaccination status uh, to the board. I'll take trustees to slide six. On slide six, we further break down our uh, vaccination um, rate here, and that as of Friday of last week, of our 7,000 or more staff who are actively working, 5,957 staff are fully vaccinated. So they've had uh, two doses of, uh, for the COVID-19. Uh, 657 staff, approximately 9%, are unvaccinated. And 637 staff, again, 9%, have not disclosed their vaccination status. What I mean by that is that they have not responded to the board's request uh, for disclosure. 
Um, and we are learning, we, as we continue to follow up, um, we learn many reasons for why this is. I'll take trustees to slide seven. When we further break down the data in terms of the 657 staff who have disclosed that they are unvaccinated, 30% of uh, this group of staff um, have received their first dose. So we know uh, that once they receive their second dose, they would be considered fully vaccinated um, and they would move out of this uh, unvaccinated group and would not be required uh, to participate in regular testing. 60% of this group of staff, 657 people, are not vaccinated for personal reasons and 10% of staff of this group are not vaccinated for medical reasons. So it takes the, uh, trustees to slide eight. Uh, staff who, are, who have disclosed that they are unvaccinated uh, are required to participate in an educational program. Um, and the, the purpose of the educational program um, requires staff to learn more about the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and this uh, program has been developed by the Ministry of Education. Staff, we anticipate we will receive uh, this educational program uh, in the coming weeks, and we will distribute it to staff uh, to view, to our unvaccinated staff uh, to review. The actual education program itself highlights how COVID-19 vaccines work, how vaccine safety uh, is related to the development of, uh, in the process of developing COVID-19 vaccines, the benefits of vaccination against uh, COVID-19, the risk of not being vaccinated against COVID-19, and also reviews what possible side effects of vaccination uh, and what they could be. Now, staff who have a medical exemption uh, would not be required to participate in, an, in the educational program once we receive it. While they are unvaccinated, they would not be required uh, to review the video as there is a documented medical reason. All of those staff who are unvaccinated will be required to review uh, such an educational program. I'll take trustees to slide nine. So all HWDSB staff who have not provided proof of, vac of vaccination are required to participate in regular rapid COVID-19 antigen testing outside of working hours at a minimum of twice a week. And staff are required to provide the board uh, with a verification of a negative test result or negative test results within the seven, the seven days, within uh, a, a week's time or the tests as they take place uh, twice a week. So staff have uh, a group of 600 plus staff who are currently unvaccinated and staff who have not disclosed their vaccination status have received information um, and the requirements for testing. Uh, staff are currently uh, undergoing this testing at an authorized pharmacy location uh, in and around the Hamilton or uh, the community in which uh, staff may live. Um, now, there is no cost to this rapid uh, testing screening if staff are attending to one of the pharmacies that we've, uh, we've identified for them, uh, and that pharmacy list has come to us by way of the ministry. Beginning next week, uh, September the 20th, staff who are unvaccinated will uh, move, from the, um, move from being tested in the pharmacy um, to testing in their home, and we will be providing uh, staff who are unvaccinated and have, or have not disclosed their vaccination status with rapid testing kits, and they will be re staff will be responsible to share the results uh, of the test uh, with the board and upload that information uh, to ensure that they have a negative uh, test result. Um, we'll further, uh, over the course of this week, we will continue to follow up with st all staff who have not disclosed their vaccination status uh, to us. Um, as I shared earlier in the presentation, there are uh, some different reasons as to why. Some staff, for example, may be occasional staff and are, are currently not working with the board at this time while active. Um, we are and will continue to follow up 
uh, with staff individually to understand uh, why they have not responded to the board and disclosed their vaccination status. I'll take trustees to the final slide of tonight's presentation in regards to communication. Uh, all school boards have a requirement that they must collect, maintain, and disclose to the ministry on a monthly basis uh, COVID-19 vaccination uh, numbers uh, in, a in a manner that's been set out uh, by the ministry uh, following uh, their template. On Friday of last week, uh, we met that our first deadline whereby HWDSB shared our um, statistical information, uh, much of what I've shared with trustees this evening, uh, regarding attestations, we've shared that information with the ministry. On Wednesday this week, uh, we will publicly post, as directed by the ministry, uh, depersonalized statistical information, and we will continue to post our uh, data on a monthly basis. Uh, the uh, board staff and the general public will have the ability to uh, log on to the HWDSB website and review that information. Uh, and it will be updated monthly. Our next reporting timeline, last Friday was our first key date. Our second key date now for reporting to the ministry uh, will be September 24th. And again, we'll continue to share information uh, with the ministry and report accordingly uh, within the timeline and further update uh, our board website uh, following that report to the ministry themselves. Here lies uh, my presentation this evening and happy to answer any questions uh, trustees may have. Thank you, Superintendent Nunn. Uh, I just will note, uh, Trustee Pekin Miller indicated that she is present for this meeting. Trustee Pekin Miller, can I just confirm that you're on the line? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. And I know I heard our student trustee is coming in and out, so hopefully we figured that out. Student trustee Mahmoud, are you in the meeting now? Yes. Thank you. And student trustee Adele Hafiz? I'm here. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so I'm going to go through the, the roll call to see if there are questions, um, starting with trustee Bingham. No questions at this time, but I do want to uh, thank the staff because this is, again, something that has been hugely and quickly undertaken. And I just it blows my mind how, how quickly they can do these. So thank you once again, Jimmy, and all your staff uh, and everyone who's involved. Thank you. Trustee Buck? Um, no comments or questions for now. Thank you. Trustee Dee. Thank you. Just one question. When... Um, when anyone uh, lists a personal reason for not getting a vaccine, do they have to state what that personal reason is? I don't think I've heard that they have to, but I'm just wondering if if, uh, if that's happening at all. Thank you. Superintendent Nunn? And through the chair, uh, staff do not need to dis um, disclose a reason for their personal choice not to disclose uh, why they've been un why they are unvaccinated. So, to the chair, if I can just add further, the data you see in front of you, based on the ministry direction at this point, uh, as Superintendent Nunn has indicated, they some have indicated a medical reason, and we're adjudicating those. And there's a few that might have indicated human rights as well. So there are some who've indicated exemption, and there's others who've just said for personal choice. So at this point, they do not have to, uh, under the current ministry direction, provide, uh, even if they did have a medical exemption, they could take the route of just indicating a personal choice at this point in time through the chair. Thank you. Trustee Dean? Uh, that helps. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to Trustee, or Vice Chair Galindo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have any questions at this time, but I do appreciate the presentation and the amount of work that has gone into um, this policy so far. So thank you. Thank you. Trustee Johnstone. Thank you. Um, I'm just, just with regards to um, 
Uh, my first question has to do with, so we're working with two pharmacies in order to do um, the um, antigen ra- rapid testing. Is that correct? Superintendent Nunn? So through the chair, I'll begin, and Superintendent Nunn can add. At this point in time, uh, the ministry is sending, has sent rapid antigen testing. They were received by test kits. Um, the, they also submitted a list of approved pharmacies that um, staff could attend, and they would the fee would be waived as long as we provided them a letter of employment, which Human Resources has. But I'll have Superintendent Nunn speak about the next step, which is um, the, the process after September 21st, which is the time frame the ministry expects boards to shift from pharmacies to distributing the kits to staff. Superintendent Nunn. Uh, thank you, and through the chair. So beginning next week, uh, staff will be required to come to the education center and uh, pick up a rapid testing kit and will be required to uh, test uh, rapidly test themselves twice a week and then further up um, provide the board with the results of their test um, and then we'll out, there's a further outline for staff by way of uh, in the event the staff have a they are, it's a positive test uh, but uh, staff are able to continue to work uh, they are required to test at home uh, and they are required to upload this is only for staff who are unvaccinated. Through the chair. Thank you, Jesse Johnson. Thank you, and if you can clarify, um, so it's no no cost to staff, but um, um, can you relay? It is the board that is paying for it. Um, what is that? What is the cost, and who's who's covering it? Thank you. To the director. So through the chair, at this point, the Ministry of Education is covering the cost, whether that cost right now is at the pharmacies and the fees being waived for employees. My assumption is when they show the letter, then the pharmacy will be being be reimbursed by the Ministry of Education. And the rapid test kits have been delivered just like PPE has been delivered. And that is now that cost at this point in time is still the Ministry of Education through the chair. Trustee Johnson. Thank you. So we don't, we don't. There's still a public cost. It's just not bore by the um, by the board, and we don't have an idea about how much a rapid test would generally cost. Um, so I, um, with that, my, with regards to individuals testing themselves, how would we check on quality of that? My. Um, I understand that Ottawa Public Health, uh, as well as various other public health, have issued cautions that um, uh, the rapid antigen uh, testing is not always effective and that um, especially where individuals are asystematic, where individuals are systematic, it is effective. Um, so how do we ensure, I guess, the, the quality of, of this? Uh, if individuals are testing themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Just to clarify your question, Trustee Johnstone, are you referring to uh, whether or not the test would have false positives or negatives or how the test is administered? Both, actually, um, just in terms of... Um, uh, so I, I have concerns uh, just with regards to um, other public health units um, issuing... I guess raising the concern that um, these tests are not um, always effective, um, so it's the test itself. And then number two, if individuals are administering it themselves, how would we know that they're doing it so correctly? So, for example, um, you're supposed to hold the swab in your nose for a certain period of time. How how would that be ensured? I know... Um, Previously, uh, through my line of employment, whenever I needed to go into a retirement home, um, these tests were previously administered by uh, a nurse, a registered nurse, um, who was able, who was qualified and trained. Uh, so I'm just wondering, with regards to how we would ensure individuals were even doing the test correctly. Thank you. Thank you. To the director. Thank you. Through the chair, I trust to Trustee Johnstone, uh, two questions. The first question is what we're doing is providing 
the best information we can. The ministry has provided us with a set of instructions that uh, they have worked with with the Ministry of Health. Uh, but Trustee Johnson's question is that these are to be done, administered at home, and then the information uploaded. So in terms of quality control as an organization, we don't have quality control of the testing process. What we're doing is providing the most relevant information and instructions. And the second piece, if someone does test um, positive, then there is a step to follow. Uh, one is to seek conf confirmation through a PCR test immediately as, at a designated testing center, and staff have to isolate immediately until the result is confirmed from the PCR test. So there are steps we work through, and uh, again, we'll work through public health around that. Uh, so that's the, the update to Trustee Johnstone's two questions. Thank you, Justin. Um, so I'll just I'll just highlight that um, I, I do think it's concerning because we are employers um, that um, we, as a board, although we are following provincial guidelines and the provincial, um, I guess. Um, administering the, the provincial products uh, with regards to the the testing, um, the fact that we don't have any oversight over quality control is concerning. That's an area that I do want to flag for staff, and I think that we need to look into how we can support that better. Um, I think training is important, but as we know with all education and learning, one-time training is usually never enough, and uh, we want to make sure individuals are continue to do it correctly uh, the whole way through. My other question had to do with medical exception exemptions. Um, are we following um, board's uh, collective agreements in terms of how medical exemptions are being, um, I guess, processed and administered? Thank you. To the director. Through the chair, can I just that question be asked again? I'm just trying to understand the question again around the connection to collective agreements, please, through the chair. Sure. So with regards to the medical exemptions uh, for COVID-19 vaccinations, um, are we adhering to collective agreements? Yes. Through the chair, we are following our collective agreements. We're ensuring that we're adjudicating any medical exemption. Uh, through experts, so this is a new territory, as we know, around vaccinations and the requirement. So we're consistently applying the practice, and we are uh, working with the third party to help us adjudicate these medical exemptions through the chair. Trustee Johnson. Okay. Um, I will. I'll continue on then. Um, I guess uh, if you're saying that we are in compliance, um, and uh, I guess uh, my final question has to do with um, uh, with regards to. Uh, so I just want to make sure that I have this very clear under the provincial directive. Uh, so the new provincial directive, and individuals are required to either a show proof of a vaccination, B, uh, show proof of an exemp exemption under the Human Rights Code. Um, so that would be medical, religion, religion or creed. And then, um, or a variety of other, um, anything that falls within uh, the Human Rights Code. Um, and then the third is that no reasoning is provided. Uh, the individual is able to refuse um, or decline, uh, I guess, stating they're either providing either proof of an exemption uh, or need for a proof of an, uh, an exemption or uh, they're not uh, verifying their vaccination status and therefore they would be required to undergo education and training um, and then undergo uh, rapid antigen testing two times a week. Is that is that correct? So there's three kind of options under the provincial directive that uh, you can, um, I guess, in order to be compliant. Uh, thank you, Trustee Johnson. I, I will maybe just point you, I believe, to slide two. Um, the exemption is only for medical, but I'll turn to the director for further clarification. 
So thank you through the chair. Um, Trustee Johnson is correct. There are um, exemptions that the board would need to approve and obtain further information, whether that would be a medical or potentially religious or creed. Um, there could be some, but Trustee Johnson has captured all those pathways. In addition, that people could just say personal choice at this point in time based on the direction and choose not to disclose uh, and choose not to request an exemption other than I, it's my personal choice and engage in rapid antigen testing on a weekly basis through the chair. Trustee Johnson, I'll just note you're almost at your five minutes. Okay, thank you. I will wrap up there. Thank you uh, to staff. I, I just want to close by stating a sincere thanks to staff. Um, uh, although not, uh, not as I guess severe is last year. Um, it is still working with uh, extremely tight timelines handed down from the province. I will state that once again, I'm extremely disappointed that the province uh, did not utilize all of the spring and all of the summer in order to uh, provide clear communications to boards. Um, indeed, school had already started by the time they came out with uh, direction and uh, I appreciate all the work that our staff do um, across the entire system, uh, from the director to the exec council to our principals and vice principals, and then to all of our staff um, who have uh, been going through all of the rules and regulations, trying to understand them in order to keep the health and safety of our of our students and staff at utmost and uh, priority. And I, I just want to thank everyone. So, and that is all. Thank you. Trustee Miller. Um, thank you. And just one quick question for clarification. Um, I know that uh, those uh, folks who have medical exemptions will not be required to um, participate in the ministry um, program on, on COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, will... I assume the folks who are unvaccinated will uh, have to attend that if they're not intending to uh, pursue any vaccination. Um, but then will we also require all of, um, I believe it was 9% um, of the people who have chosen to not disclose? Um, so I assume that, but I just wanted that clarification if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the director? Yes, through the chair, to Trustee Miller's question. So staff members who who, um, who have an approved medical exemption after adjudicated um, won't have to do the educational session, and you're correct, but will have to do the regular weekly testing, which is twice every seven days or twice a week. The staff who have not disclosed at this point in time, human resources staff is following up, and they will be treated as staff who are unvaccinated and will be required to participate in the uh, weekly rapid antigen testing and to share that information through the chair. Thank you, Trustee Miller. Uh, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, I will leave my questions for um, any of my other questions for later in the meeting, um, but just wanted to echo the sentiments that have already been said. Uh, thank you for to staff who, who worked so um, quickly to provide us with this snapshot. I think it's very informative. Um, and hopefully the, the numbers will continue to improve. Um, thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Mulholland. No questions. Thank you. Trustee Jason Miller. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Tuck. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Student Trustee McNeil. Thank you. Uh, no questions or comments at this time. Thank you. Student Trustee Abdel Hathi. Thank you. And through the chair, I do have a quick question. Um, I was wondering whether school visitors that aren't technically employed by HWSB um, that do visit schools frequently, um, I was wondering whether they would be required to be fully vaccinated and how um, the, the board would be able to keep track of that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. To the director. Thank you. And to uh, student uh, trustee 
Thank you for the question. Yes, under this immunization disclosure and uh, direction from the ministry, all frequent visitors are, are required. At this point in time, we are work, working on staff and we're working on a bit of protocol for some volunteers who, uh, who've been able to gain access because of a program um, uh, being able to get up and running in September. But we put a pause on most volunteers at this point uh, so we can work through the staff piece first and then work through the next piece, uh, which is uh, other visitors, including volunteers, into the school. More information will come at the September 27th board meeting at our next COVID update. Through the chair. Thank you. Student Trustee Adelphi. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and as a follow-up question, in, I know we put a pause on volunteers right now, but in the future or throughout the year, um, I was wondering if students that I know some students want go back and, and volunteer at their old elementary schools, um, and I was wondering if those kinds of visitors that are HWC students, would they be required to be fully vaccinated because technically they are visiting the school? Um, and, yeah, thank you. Thank you to the director. Yeah, so thank you through the chair. As we work through public health, we're really trying to limit um, volunteers right now um, based on the, the COVID numbers. However, if there are students, HWDSB students who are going into elementary schools because it's part of a co-op program, then of course we go through that process. But right now we're working with public health uh, around the next phase of, of introducing volunteers, including HWDSB students who might want to go to elementary schools. Um, we're being cautious right now in terms of mixing cohorts and who comes in the building as we do our startup, but more information will come. But they would be grouped under volunteers and the question would be, are they frequent or essential volunteers or not is the group we're looking at first through the chair. Thank you. To the student trustee, any follow-up? Thank you. That's, that's all for me. Thank you. And Senegana, Segawana, Garla, uh, Ken, Kedi? Sorry, Sega one ago, we got Kid. Sorry, is it Kiji or Kiggy? Uh, we haven't had a chance to chat in person. Are you on the line? Sorry, um, no questions or comments at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, and that just leaves me. Um, so I'll just echo the thanks for uh, to staff for all of the work that's gone into getting this into place very quickly. Uh, it has been a source of frustration for me as well that, you know, some of the details are still, we're still waiting some from the ministry. And I, I appreciate uh, that we're, we're taking a cautious approach at this time with volunteers, although I know we absolutely value our dedicated volunteers and would like to see them back in schools um, when possible, but safety uh, needs to come first at this time. In terms of my questions, I think most of them have been asked, so I appreciate that we're following up with anyone who has not disclosed their vaccination status, and we've had some of the, the reasons indicated. Um, I guess my question is around if, if we do have someone who refuses to disclose and refuses to do the testing, um, do we have a procedure in place for that to the director? Yes, through the chair. Uh, we know there might be some staff who might be vaccine hesitant um, um, and our first approach is always to work through um, education, to try to educate and understand why. However, the ministry has been very clear that, um, that everyone who enters the building, our staff, to start the year is either fully vaccinated or participating in weekly rapid antigen testing. So, um, and that those are the only two choices. So if, you know, so if someone chooses not to be fully vaccinated and under pro personal choice chooses not to uh, participate in regular testing, then our other human resource policies would apply. Um, we have, um, so when there's a direction from an employer we expect to follow, we first seek to understand, but if, uh, we can't 
support the staff member's decision, then we would look at our progressive discipline policy. Um, so scientific skepticism about vaccination is, is not a ground for an exemption or an accommodation, and um, and uh, and not do, participating in the rapid antigen testing is also not an option unless someone you know did have some kind of allergic reason. But we would go through the medical exemption. So it could lead to someone um, being put uh, on an unpaid leave of absence until further notice. Uh, as we work through trying to understand why, but there's a clear expectation um, the ministry has set for all boards that every staff member entering is either under two buckets, fully vaccinated or participating in regular antigen testing. So our human resource uh, staff will work with our union partners regarding this, uh, but that is uh, a pathway that we're um, that we're planning for, uh, and hopefully we don't need that, but there is the possibility through the chair. Thank you. And my other question is regarding the educational program. Uh, I understood that that was going to be provided by the Ministry of Education, but we haven't received it at this point. Um, do we have a, any timelines for that, and do we have a sense of who would be delivering it? Uh, I believe I heard Superintendent Nunn mention uh, a video type of education session, and I was hoping it would involve a, perhaps a medical provider as opposed to just a, a video, but if I can get some clarity on that education program for staff. So through the chair, we were indicated by around September 10th we should be receiving, um, a, we were told that it would be in a video format that the Ministry of Education is working with on the Ministry of Health, and the Ministry of Education has asked us to use that a video format as a consistent approach. To date, um, we did receive further memo today, but at this point in time, we do not have the um, video educational um, piece as of today. We, we are still waiting for that from the, from the Ministry of Education through the chair. Thank you. Those are all of my questions. So at this time, we are just uh, receiving this information. Um, there's nothing to approve. And uh, trustees, we can move on to item 7, which is our written notice of motion from Trustee Johnstone regarding enhanced COVID-19 precautions. I'll invite trustees to uh, open the notice of motion. It is very lengthy. And uh, Trustee Johnstone, I'll invite you to read your motion aloud. Thank you. Um, so I'll begin by reading the motion aloud. Whereas public education is the cornerstone and foundation of a healthy, vital, and progressive society, and whereas keeping schools open has been deemed a priority for children's learning, mental health, and well-being, whereas the data shows that being fully vaccinated significantly reduces the risk of the most serious outcomes of COVID-19, including the variant um, of concern to date, and whereas vaccines are readily available throughout Hamilton, whereas it is incumbent upon society to protect children under 12 who are not eligible, who are ineligible to be vaccinated at this time, and vulnerable populations who are at the highest risk of developing complications from COVID-19, and whereas Ontario has a precedent for requiring vaccinations to protect children and ensure schools remain as safe as possible. Be it resolved that, one, HWDSB work collaboratively with Hamilton's local public health unit, local partners, and HWDSB employee groups to develop a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination procedure that is grounded in education and in supportive incentives. A, requires all employees, trustees, service providers, and volunteers to provide proof of a full vaccination against COVID-19 while adhering to legislated privacy standards. B, requires any employee, trustee, or service provider who is not fully vaccinated to participate in an exemption process with approvals where there is a legal obligation to accommodate. And C, for anyone who is not adhering to the procedure, requires uh, requirements by an established deadline that staff develop appropriate steps, including limiting access to physical environments at HWDSB. And B, requires employee, any employee, trustee, or service provider who has an improved 
uh, formal exemption and is not vaccinated be accommodated and required to complete regular asystematic rapid testing and demonstrate a negative test as per the recommendations by public health. That's item A. Item two, that HWDSB exercise enhanced precautions for higher risk school activities, including but not limited to wind instruments, singing, assemblies, and contact sports and school settings. Enhanced precautions can include limiting activities outdoors, asystematic rapid testing for students, and or bell covers or additional masking requirements for musical instruments. Three, that HWDSB receive and consider reducing or waiving or subsidizing school fees for the 2021-2022 school year in partnership with the Hamilton Foundation for Student Success given that many Hamilton families have lost jobs and are facing financial hardship as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Four, that the chair write a letter to the local chief medical officer of health, Ontario's chief medical officer of health, and the minister of education, affirming that the board supports COVID-19 vaccines be added to the list of compulsory vaccinations under the Immunization of School Pupils Act for all eligible students, is advocated by the Ontario Public School Boards Association. And finally, five, that the chair write a letter to the local uh, medical chief medical officers of health, Ontario's chief medical officer of health, the minister of education and the minister of health asking that they apply a first to open and last to close approach to school closures to protect public education to the greatest extent possible. Thank you, Trustee Johnstone. Um, I believe Trustee Tut has signaled he wanted to second this motion. Is that the case, Trustee Tut? That is, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to um, set the stage for trustees. We do have one motion, but it has multiple parts. Uh, just as when we receive a report with multiple parts, we will debate um, the entire motion, but if anyone wishes to vote separately on any of these items, please let me know when you have your moment to speak, um, and we will make sure that we separate the the vote if needed. Um, I will remind everyone that you do have five minutes, and I recognize there are five parts to this, so I I advise you to use your time wisely. I will be keeping people to the five minutes. I will start with the mover uh, with your, your opening remarks. Thank you. Through the chair. The motion before you goes above and beyond the provincial directive. Two boards, Toronto District School Board and Ottawa Carleton School Board, have passed enhanced policies to mandate vaccines. Their motions, like the one that you see before you, align with requirements set out by the Ontario Human Rights Code and ensure that... um, that accommodations are made based on medical, creed, and religious purposes. The provincial directive does not go far enough. It has significant loopholes, allowing individuals to simply decline. And let me be clear that this is, um, that the provincial directive allows these loopholes above and beyond what is stated under the Human Rights Code. These individuals are to have education training and a minimum of uh, one rapid antigen testing a week. And as I stated earlier in the night, um, there's many concerns expressed by other public health units across the province with regards to the effectiveness of rapid antigen testing um, in, in, in asystematic individuals. As trustees, we need to keep our main objective, our students and staff, at the forefront. This is why I'm asking for enhanced COVID-19 measures. We cannot close schools again. It doesn't work for the vast majority of our students. We saw the severe impact to students' learning and mental health this past year. We must do everything within our capacity to prevent school closures again. And as the vast majority of our students, who are under the age of 12 cannot be vaccinated, we need to look uh, look towards protecting their health and safety, as well as our most vulnerable, including students and staff who are immune compromised and also cannot receive the vaccination. 
So I'm asking students, or I'm asking trustees tonight um, for your support for this motion. Um, as stated, there's two other boards that have gone above and beyond. Um, it closes some of the loopholes uh, with regards to individuals who can, who have the opportunity to make a, I guess, a, a political a political statement in terms of not um, not providing proof of a vaccination or proof of um, an accommodation that accommodation needs to be made under the Human Rights Code, and most importantly, it puts the health and safety of our students and staff at the at the very top, which is what we're here to do. And um, I thank you, uh, I thank you, trustees, for looking at tonight's motion. Thank you, Trustee Johnstone. Uh, Trustee Tett, as a seconder, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll keep my uh, remarks brief because I think Tr Trustee Johnstone uh, captured uh, the spirit of this motion. I think overall um, this motion is a natural progression from the previous motion that uh, we had passed, and I think it's absolutely important that, that we continue on this path and we make sure that we take all steps that are necessary to make sure that we protect those most vulnerable, which is our students, our staff, and the families that frequent our properties, HWDSB. I think uh, based on, on everything that each one of us has stood for in the past, I think we need to pass, I think we need to continue with the momentum, particularly in the face of a new wave and with increasing numbers, uh, I think it's the right thing to do and we make sure we continue to hammer home that message that, you know, vaccinations will help us get out of uh, this pandemic eventually. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, those are my remarks. I encourage my fellow colleagues to support this motion, to take a stand and, and let uh, our school community know that we, we will protect them and take steps to protect them in any which way, including those students that, including those students that haven't had an opportunity to, to get the vaccine because they're, they're not eligible due to their age. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Trustee Tutt. Uh, so we'll go through the roll call in reverse alphabetical order and student trustees, we will come to you at the end. I can find my list. Uh, Trustee Pickin-Miller, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, no, I'm okay with it. I I'll support it. Thank you. Trustee Mulholland? Um, no questions. Thank you. Trustee Miller? Um, thank you. And I have a couple of questions. I am curious. Um, I, I, do, I do believe in vaccines. I do believe that... Um, Another school closure, closure um, another school lockdown would be um, significantly detrimental to the students and the families um, in our communities. However, I do, um, and perhaps I could, uh, through the chair, ask this question to staff, I would like to... Um, have a bit of a better sense in terms of how the motion that we see tonight would play out in supporting our employees. Um, we all know that there are various reasons that um, an individual may or may not have been vaccinated, uh, fully vaccinated to date. Um, but I am curious if there is an individual that for whatever reason, medical or personal, religious, um, has chosen to, to not be fully vaccinated, but has moved to say, you know, I will commit to the rapid testing. I will, um, you know, participate in any of the other safety measures that uh, we understand to be necessary to stop the spread of COVID-19. I, I would like to just get a better sense of if an individual is willing to do that on a regular basis, twice a week, um, would this current motion um, 
jeopardize their employment, jeopardize their safety, um, or jeopardize their employment or their standing within our board. I hope that's clear, but let me know if I need to re recapture that. Thank you. I'll go to the director. Uh, thank you. Through the chair. Uh, let me begin by just stating if this is passed this evening that um, staff would engage in really three key legis pieces of legislation that would guide the development of the procedure and definitely we would have to build a time frame, an appropriate ramp um, to engage with our, um, um, our unions and, and, and our management group. But it's really three. It's the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which means every employer must show reasonable precautions to protect health and safety of workers and students in, in the workplace. The second, of course, is the Ontario Human Rights Code to make sure that the proper exemptions, whether um, they, they are medical reasons or human rights when it comes to religious um, objection or creed, would be considered. And the third, which is really important too, is the Personal Health Information Protection Act of 2004, SIPA. So we have to ensure that all um, proof of vaccination information, which we're doing now, and other personal information collected is in accordance with this policy and it's kept in strict uh, confidence. So those would be the three key pieces of legislation. However, to Trustee Miller's question, if this is approved tonight, what it would remove is the only exemptions that would be considered would be under the Ontario Human Rights Code, which would be medical or religious or creed. It would eliminate the personal choice if approved, which means that uh, staff members who might have scientific skepticism about the vaccination, um, that would not be grounds under the Ontario Human Rights Code and would not be grounds uh, for an exemption or an accommodation. So right now we don't know, you know, under the personal choice category, um, if this was approved, how many people might pursue a different pathway, but they would need to be approved. So um, a long way to saying that if this is approved and someone does not qualify under the Ontario Human Rights Code for an exemption, um, they would not have the choice then to participate in um, rapid antigen testing if they were uh, approved through a proper exemption. So could it impact someone's employment in the future? Yes, we would build hopefully appropriate ramp for that, for that time frame. I hope that answers through the chair the trustees question. Thank you. Trustee Miller? Um, thank you very much to the director. I appreciate how um, complicated it is to sort of speak um, about very, very specific future scenarios. Um, so I do, I do appreciate uh, the director taking the time to walk me through that. Um, I think I think at the moment that that will be my question for, for this right now. I'm, I'm I will say that I'm curious to hear from my fellow trustees um, and and just see what, what other folks are saying. Thank you so much. Thank you, Trustee Miller. Um, Vice Chair Glendo. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, uh, logic clearly dictates that uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few and for that reason, I am in support of this motion in its entirety. Uh, I think that we need to all um, we need to really, like the best way to protect our students and staff is to get everyone vaccinated and uh, we need to do everything we can as a board to uh, support that uh, policy issue because uh, I very much see it as an equity issue. It's also a social determinant of health and therefore uh, it is our responsibility to do everything we can. Uh, I should also mention that the Home and School Association shared a letter with myself and the chair last night in support of this motion. I shared it with trustees by email, and I'll speak to this more later tonight during my oral report as the uh, board liaison to that committee. Uh, but they do know that the uh, that parent involvement is a critical component of mental health and positive well-being, uh, and therefore uh, you know, feel that caregivers and community volunteers within schools contribute significantly to the positive school climate by offering support. Uh, this is essential, especially uh, during these difficult times. Uh, they also note that caregivers are feeling excluded, unwelcomed, and ignored and have up to this point 
so they do support the motion, particularly when it comes to allowing volunteers back into schools, and they suggest that the policy allow for volunteers to follow the same guidelines and criteria as trustees, board employees, and service providers. Uh, so that's all I'll say on that motion, and I do thank the trustee for bringing that forward. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's just uh, maybe important to clarify that under the motion as it is written, volunteers would not be uh, able to follow the rapid testing protocol or exemption process. They would simply be required to have a proof of full vaccination in 1A. Um, you know that 1B, C, and D does not include volunteers. They're not employees, and uh, there would be some challenges around that. Just want to make sure that's clear, Trustee Galindo. Clear as day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving along to Trustee Dees. Thank you, uh, through the chair, and I, I do support this motion. Um, it, it's well written and, and comprehensive. My only concern is uh, I'm not even sure if we go far enough because this is where, uh, even though if you're fully vaccinated, with new variants coming out now that may be vaccine tolerant, um, I, I'm just wondering if beyond this motion, and this would be, I guess, a question for the director, is are we still limiting movement between schools? Um, and, and same with volunteers. Even as volunteers, and, and we all want to see, you know, extracurriculars, and, and we want to see volunteers in the building, and we know the importance. Um, but, you know, as has been stated, you know, top priority is keeping our students and staff safe. So I'm just concerned with seeing now that this new variant has been detected in Hamilton. Um, just are we doing enough by saying, okay, if you're fully vaccinated, uh, you can come into our school? Thank you. To the director. Uh, thank you. Through the chair to Trustee Deep's question. If this is approved tonight, we would do some research, of course, um, with our medical experts. But as I, as I look at other organizations who've already gone down this path and started to develop a policy or procedure, um, they clearly indicate that, um, that people would have to have COVID-19 vaccinations and any further recommended booster vaccinations as recommended by the province or federal government or the local public health authority. So if approved, we would take this away and make sure our procedure defines that fully vaccinated would likely include any further recommended booster vaccines because of the, uh, of the changing variants that, that are occurring in our province. Through the chair. Thank you, Trustee Dean. Thank you. I, I'm just wondering because, I, I mean, I, I understand that as they, you know, try to uh, understand this new variant and, and, you know, how it's going to be transmitted and and um, and how uh, tolerant it is to the vaccine. Because uh, I know in the beginning of this, you know, we did limit, um, you know, movement between schools. Um, and I, I don't want to say unnecessary visits, but, I mean, I'll say, you know, as a trustee, I mean, I would love to go and visit my schools again, uh, you know, even though I'm fully vaccinated. But I am aware that, that um, you can still transmit it. Even if you're fully vaccinated, you can transmit it. So, I, and, and I think now is the time, and, and I know everybody's exhausted with this, um, but now is, you know, not the time to, I think, ease up at all because, you know, the last thing we want to do is to see schools have to shut down because, as you know, was stated, the impact on mental health and students and everything else. So I'm just wondering if we can continue to take those extra precautions and limit even to those fully vaccinated you know, limit visits to school, limit travel between schools, um, those ty types of things uh, through the chair. Thank you. To the director. Uh, so through the chair, two parts. Let me state that when we bring the COVID update, the reopening update on September 27th, we'll, exp we'll provide a further update of where we're going above the reopening guidance document, such as not allowing assemblies at this time uh, in schools, which the guidance document has said we could, in addition of outdoors, making sure um, our students are in cohorts as much as possible. But we'll provide it, um, an update on September 27th to show the public health enhancements we're continuing to put in place. 
But in terms of the second question, if approved tonight, how, of course, how staff would interpret this and get a legal opinion, of course, would be that fully vaccinated uh, staff, especially or, or, or volunteers in Section A, would be approved um, to enter our school as public health or the province or the federal government, how they define fully vaccinated. Right now it's two vaccines, and that could change to two vaccines, including a booster. But we'll, um, but if approved tonight, it, uh, staff would have a challenge to not allow visitors fully vaccinated into building unless we receive a different direction from the province or public health through the chair. Thank you. Trustee Deeds. I appreciate that, and, and, and like I said, I, I know that um, we want to see volunteers and, and uh, you know, those things going on, and, and um, you know, we'll, we'll look forward to the update, uh, and I know we're taking extra precautions. I just, you know, like I said, even though we're, we are fully, maybe it's just a, you know, precaution, and it doesn't need to be added in here, but just that, um, you know, even though fully vaccinated, just if it's not absolutely necessary... Um, you know, to be there live and in person is, is just to still limit that movement just so until we get a handle on, on this new variant. So um, that's it to, to the chair. Thanks. Thank you. Trustee Buck. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to uh, parcel out all five of uh, the points in this motion uh, so that we, we vote um, on each one individually. Uh, Is that okay, possible? Thank you. Yep. Um, but I'll ask okay. you to speak to all five at this time. Yes, of course. Um, okay. okay, so uh, I won't go um, share uh, comments or questions about um, number one other than to say I really appreciated my one colleague's comments around the repercussions um, should it be passed this evening um, for our staff, uh, it would be a, a, an overstepping of their human rights. Um, item number two, um, uh, in, in this I've got, um, uh, I do have to take issue with uh, the importance of the identified activities in this portion of the motion cannot be underscored. Uh, at this point in time, students have now gone more than 18 months without music and sports by and large. Um, uh, I believe we have allowed room for an inequitable situation to now emerge. Um, and while last year it was understandable that we wouldn't have been allowed to, or sorry, that we wouldn't have been able to allow the use of wind instruments or team sports, for example, given an unknown situation that we were in, we now have the opportunity to start addressing the learning and experiential deficits that have now become quite severe. Uh, so, for example, for this year's grade 8 students, if we don't allow staff to offer music, they will have gone two crucial years without having learned an instrument in preparation for secondary school. Um, we must assume that there are many students in our system who would not otherwise have access to learning an instrument outside of their school program. The skills learned in grade 7 and 8 are naturally developed in our secondary programming. The window of opportunity to enrich the lives of many of our students through the music program is closing. The same logic applies as well to sports programs. The Ministry of Education was advised by Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health when setting the groundwork for this school year's management of enhanced public health measures. They weighed the options and the risks to students and staff, and I agree with them that music and sports need to make a responsible return to the student experience this year. Uh, in terms of item number three, uh, it, it's important to note for my colleagues that the Foundation isn't bound by the passing of this motion tonight. Uh, so trustees cannot direct um, the Hamilton Foundation for Student Success on how to use their funds. Uh, any disbursements from the foundation uh, are set up by the foundation's allocation committee in support of directors. Um, and I, I would ask at this time, would the mover be, of the motion be willing to make an amendment to the language used on this point that would instead um, have HWDSB staff approach um, Hamilton Foundation of student success staff to discuss the possibility of the foundation partially or fully funding the identified action item. Um, in this, uh, this way the staff um, could take it away and determine the details of execution. 
Thank you, Trustee Buck. Uh, just to the mover, would that be acceptable uh, to amend as sort of as a friendly yeah, amendment absolutely. to the motion? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, there was, and I uh, just to provide context, um, I um, there was. Um, I, I, my understanding is that staff are aware of uh, and actually uh, for the language around the Hamilton Foundation for uh, Student Success, um, but I can absolutely see that as a friendly amendment uh, to add the word approach in. Thank you. Thank you. So for trustees, for item three in the notice of motion, it would read that uh, we consider reducing, waiving, or subsidizing school fees for the 2021-22 school year and that staff approach the Hamilton Foundation for Student Success um, to support that, that work, given, et cetera. Uh, hopefully that's clear. Trustee Buck, back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I do appreciate my colleague's amendment um, to that piece of the motion. Um, to item four, um, di diseases that currently reside on our list of required immunizations are diseases that pose a major health threat to children. So, for example, many of the diseases on the current list of immunizations um, can lead to death uh, to a significant portion of the population. Currently, the rate of death to children who catch COVID-19 in any of its variants is less than 1%. In fact, it is even less than half of a half of a percentage point. In comparison to any of the diseases on our immunization list, the severity of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is almost non-existent to the general population of our student body. Um, so, for example, diphtheria was a leading cause of childhood death. Tetanus, globally, roughly 38,000 people die worldwide due to tetanus, but almost exclusively in parts of the world that do not have vaccinations. That's why we have it on our list. Uh, polio causes withering limbs and has major long-term consequences, even with tr treatment. Uh, measles, highly infectious disease to which complications are quite common and, in and can conclude and can include something called acute brain inflammation. Um, mumps was historically a highly prevalent disease. Complications include deafness and inflammation of the brain. Rubella, well, the prognosis for children and adults is usually mild. The prognosis in children born with congenital rubella syndrome is poor. Um, Meningococcal disease has a high mortality rate, particularly when treatment is delayed. Um, um, pertussis or whooping cough. Um, while the prognosis of adults and older children is relatively good, young children do not fare well. Um, and on uh, the list, we also have chicken pox or varicella, um, where death actually occurs in one per 60,000 cases. So, in comparison to the items that we have um, required uh, for our immunization records, uh, the the scale doesn't fit. Um, where we know that uh, that COVID-19 is going to continue to uh, evolve, um, and we are not yet sure about the uh, long-term efficacy of um, the current vaccination, um, it is too soon to say that this needs to be added to our immunization records. So I would not be in support of um, reaching out to the ministry, uh, asking them to make it so. Um, in terms of item five, uh, I would be in full support of uh, the first to open and last to close approach to schools. Uh, we have to get kids um, reaching uh, the, the standardization, and that sounds very um, cold and calculated when you say standardization, but kids need to be in class, and we need to start um, filling in those deficits that have um, been allowed to grow wider and wider over the course of the last 18 months. So full support for that. Um, and with that, no further comments or questions. Thank you, Trustee Buck. Uh, Trustee Officer Miller has just reminded me that there are no friendly amendments and we do have to vote on the, amend the suggested amendment. So um, I'll just uh, have to pause our discussion and talk about the amendment for item three on the notice of motion that um, the HWDSB review and consider reducing or waiving or subsidizing school fees for the 2021-22 school year and that staff approach the Hamilton Foundation for Student Success um, for possible support 
Given that many family, Hamilton families have lost jobs and are facing financial hardships as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that is the revised wording that's being proposed. Um, I'm just going to open it up and I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself if you wanted to speak to that amendment and then we'll vote on the amendment only. So I'll invite people um, unmute yourself if you would like to comment on the amendment. Okay, hearing none, is anyone opposed to the amended language for item three in the notice of motion? Hearing none, thank you. So that, that is the amendment or the amended uh, language that we will be voting on when we vote on all of the items. Uh, and Trustee Buck has asked that we separate those out. So we'll be voting individually on each item one through five. Moving along our list to Trustee Bingham. Yes, I do have a few, um, probably just things to um, discuss on here. Listening to everybody has, has thrown a few things out there for me. Uh, and one of the things that um, I really thought we want to be able to talk about with us, this with the public in general is that um, due to some of the uh, emails that we've been receiving, this is not voting to make it mandatory, but this is voting to enhance procedures and protocols uh, so that we can <laughs> do, our, do our darndest to be able to keep schools open and uh, keep the students in the classes. And I just want... Um, I want people to understand this is not voting to make it mandatory vaccinations. This is voting to make sure that we have uh, preca more precautions put in place. Um, and with that, my, my one, I do have a couple of questions here, but one of them is um, how close is this to or is this more than what Hamilton Public Health um, has really asked us to to look at like where where do we stand when it comes to being close to or more than Hamilton Public Health with, with this uh, motion with all of it thank you trustee Bingham I think it might be helpful just to clarify um, what what this means in terms of is it mandatory vaccination or not can you oh. maybe just clarify your, your point there yeah, so um, in looking at all of this, uh, we've had some emails that have come in from um, from constituents who have said, please don't vote for vaccination to be mandatory. And we already voted against that with the last meeting. Um, so I don't know why people are thinking this is a mandatory, we're, we're voting on something being mandatory because of what I'm reading here is that what we want are just very, very strong precautions going on so that we don't have to close down schools. We don't have to individually or altogether, uh, especially with these new variants that are coming out. Um, so so I guess my, my whole thought around this is, are we going above and beyond even what Hamilton Public Health is asking us to do? Thank you, Trustee Bingham. I'm going to turn to the director to get your question answered, but then I also want to go back to the mover just to clarify the intent of item one, um, so that we're, we're all clear. Uh, go to the director first to the question. Through the chair. So to Trustee Bingham's question, if this is passed tonight, as I read the motion that, that, that's written here, this means that we would have a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination procedure, which means the only exemptions would be through the Ontario Human Rights Code and, and religion, creed, or medical. So this would be how I'm interpreting a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination. And when I look at our municipality, I believe our, the city of Hamilton, which public health is part of, has mandated similar policy uh, regarding mandatory vaccines with the only exemptions, again, being medical health or Ontario Human Rights Code. Okay. Uh, through the chair, that's how I'm interpreting the motion if passed tonight. 
Thank you. And to the question about what, what's here that we're requiring that goes beyond what Hamilton Public Health is recommending, uh, can you speak to that, Mr. Director? Yeah, so through the chair, public health through our partnership has always been supporting and endorsing vaccination and to increase vaccine, vaccination rates within our community for everyone who's 12 and up to be eligible. However, they do also honor that organizations that are implementing a mandatory vaccine requirement have to adhere to uh, current legislation when it comes to providing appropriate exemptions, um, which this motion is passed tonight would allow that to occur through the chair. Uh, thank you. And uh, Trustee Bingham, I'm just going to turn to the mover just to get, again, clarification on item one so that we're all on the same page. Trustee Johnson, can you just mm -hmm. clarify the intent of the motion? Yes, I think that um, just, uh, and I think the director um, captured it quite well, um, but the ministry has come out with a directive with regards to vaccinations um, uh, for education workers, as well as other, other sectors across the province. However, there's many loopholes within that uh, directive. Uh, so one of the uh, loopholes that I am looking to to address is um, uh, to ensure that we are making accommodations where required. Um, so if someone's not able to um, be vaccinated, um, that they're that they're able to show proof uh, um, for a reason as per the Ontario Human Rights Code. Um, the Ontario Directive uh, allows for an additional exception where individuals can have opt for a personal choice, personal preference. And in those scenarios, they do not have to provide proof of a vaccination. They do not have to provide proof of a medical exception or creed or religion. Um, and in those instances, they undertake some education training, so a video uh, and a test, I believe. Um, and then uh, similar to those individuals who cannot vaccinate under the Human Rights Code, um, these individuals would go through for regular testing. It's, it's an unnecessary um, allowance. And so when we're looking at keeping schools uh, uh, open, it's about ensuring that we're doing, um, the intent of this motion is to ensure that we're doing all that we can um, to, to keep schools open. I hope that clarifies uh, for, for the trustee. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, back to you, Trustee Bingham. Uh, yeah, it does clarify, and, and I'm just thinking it's it's um, it's on the same level as our regular policy for vaccinations, as it is um, that we do look toward Hamilton Public Health for it as well. So, yes, that that does clarify. And the big word um, that came out of this very clearly for me was accommodate. So, accommodating for those who who cannot or do not for the the um, the right reasons in there. Um, uh, yeah, so the only other thing would be, um, uh, no, that's okay. So that's it. I'm reading some notes that, uh, that I took down from everyone else's, uh, so policies and procedures and, um, yeah. Okay. So, um, that. I believe I'm I'm in support of it. I'm just there's there's a few things that where the wording was was throwing me off a bit. And hearing some people, hearing some of the other trustees has um, made me stop to really reread what this is about. Uh, but I I do agree with with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bingham. I'll turn to our student trustees, starting with Sigawana Galvadat Kigi. Uh, no questions or comments, thanks. Uh, thank you, student trustee Abdel Hafiz. Thank you. Um, and through the chair, I don't have any qu questions as of now. Uh, however, I would like to say that I completely support the motion. Um, and I think it's crucial to do all that we can to protect our staff and students and do everything in our power to steer away from the risk of any possible school closures. Um, it's been a very rough year for our school community, and I, I 
believe we cannot risk staff and student health, as well as risk affecting student success rates, as well as student well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Student Trustee Mahmood? Mahmood, sorry. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I first wanted to um, just touch upon some of the items in this motion that I think are particularly relevant to students. First, I just wanted to say I think that these are steps that are necessary to ensuring um, a school year that is safe for students and that um, students can continue to be successful and stay in school. Um, when it comes to the second item, um, as kind of mentioned before, I think that um, taking precautions where necessary, but also finding a balance of um, maintaining those extracurriculars for students is really, really important. Um, it can sometimes be easy to overlook um, extracurricular activities in schools, but it is a really uh, crucial part of the learning experience for so many students. Um, so finding a balance of um, maintaining safety and well-being, but also, you know, making those opportunities available for students as much as we can. Um, when it comes to the fourth item in the motion, um, I think that it's really a really unnecessary step to be taking right now. Um, the Immunization of School Pupils Act has been around in Ontario for a long time, and I think when it comes to COVID-19, um, we, we, we're still understanding the scientific um, long-term effects, and we don't really know how it might affect um, young people in the long term. We're learning more and more about uh, long-haul COVID, um, things that we didn't know even a few months in the past about how people can be affected uh, by the virus. And this is a system and a policy that has been in place um, for a long time. I think that um, this goes hand in hand with making vaccines as accessible as possible to students, um, which I think the board has been doing successfully opening up uh, clinics at secondary schools. Um, but from a student perspective, I think that this is probably the most um, important item on the motion uh, when it comes to uh, ensuring student safety. Uh, I just had a quick question as well. Um, I was wondering if there would be a recorded vote for the student trustees. Uh, thank you. So yes, for each vote, we will record all trustees and student trustee votes. All right, thank you. Thank you. And so that's the end of the list aside from myself. Um, and I'll just, and then I'll turn back to the mover for closing remarks. I really appreciate the, the questions and discussion that's happened tonight. Um, I, I have to be honest, I've, I, I firmly believe that we need to do everything we can, uh, as it was very nicely said by our student trustees, to take all the steps necessary to ensure a safe and successful school year for students. And I think when we're thinking about where is the risk for people, um, the risk is not just related to COVID, the disease itself, the risk is related to school closures. And when we look at that from, um, you know, even an equity lens, uh, the impacts on students who may already be vulnerable, we're seeing that, you know, one positive case in schools can impact 85 students. And for those families where there's some isolation at home for up to 10 days, that is a significant impact. And it's a significant disruption for those students. And as we heard from our student trustees and, and from other trustees, it, it's not just about the impacts of COVID-19 um, as a disease, it's about the impacts uh, when we close schools and we don't have our routines and we don't have access to activities that really support a student's health and well-being, that, that, that health and well-being is impacted. Uh, so for that reason, I do support these additional steps. I, I have had conversations about you know, the, the potential impact on employees. So the one question I do have for the director regarding item one, a mandatory vaccine procedure, recognizing that um, many organizations are implementing these procedures and and public health recommends that organizations have such procedures. 
if we run into problems um, either from a legal perspective or if, you know, our union partners identify a, a challenge, will staff come back to trustees um, to, to confirm steps going forward? Um, at what point would this come back to trustees, to the directors? So through the chair, and I, uh, I'm glad the chair raised that question. If this is passed tonight, um, staff will not will begin the process of developing a procedure, but will need time to again uh, create a procedure that honors um, the legis three legislations I identified: the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the Terry Human Rights Code, and um, Personal Health Information Protection Act. We will um, again engage with get some legal advice, speak to public health, and also our union partners. Uh, we will um, bring an update um, to trustees, and realistically, uh, I just want to put this on the table so we can manage expectations. When I'm looking at what's in place right now, we're still acting on the provincial direction from human resources. I'm foreseeing that this would take potentially a, a couple months for us to put in, put in place and develop the appropriate ramp. If we run into some risks that we did not put on the table today or new risks that are brought to our attention, then I will bring that to the Board of Trustees um, uh, for an update um, as, soon as, as soon as I'm aware of that risk through the Chair. Thank you. To item two, um, I think when I read this, it's encouraging enhanced precautions for higher risk school activities, but it's not suggesting that we eliminate uh, school activities, and I, I personally believe, as was stated again uh, very eloquently by our student trustees and other trustees, the importance of all of the activities that go along with school, including extracurricular, um, is absolutely critical. It, it can make or break a student's experience, and we don't get time back. When a student finishes elementary school, they don't get to go back and experience grade seven and eight again. And I think we have to do everything in our power to make sure they have a fulsome experience. They have access to activities that they may not have access to at home, as was mentioned. So the intent behind item two, from my perspective, um, and the, the mover can clarify that in the closing remarks if needed, is that we are not uh, canceling any of these activities. We are just looking at enhanced precautions to make it as safe as possible. And again, we may need staff to come back if uh, there are challenges. In terms of the other items, I think they've been spoken to, but I'll just go again to the, the last item that we take. We ask the, the ministry to take a first to open and last to close approach to school closures. And this may seem like a redundant point. We've heard them make that commitment, but, but we have to go back to June, where that commitment was not the approach that was taken. Um, we do have experience with schools not being the last to close and the first to open. So I think highlighting the importance of that, highlighting, again, that, that the government sticks to what they've committed to uh, with a regional approach based on local context, minimizing any online time for students, whether it's through a cohort closure or a school closure, um, I think that is going to be critical for a successful and a safe year for students. And of course, uh, we're also worried about the safety of our staff, and I believe that these additional, additional precautions and asks of the ministry um, will, of course, support our staff as well in their workplace. Those are my comments and questions. I'll turn it back to the member for closing remarks. Trustee Johnstone? Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to my colleagues uh, for, as always, for such a, a thoughtful discussion. Uh, I, I sincerely appreciate it. Um, I, I do want to just note um, that on August 17th, Ontario's teachers' unions did call for stricter measures and specifically called for mandating vaccinations um, in, in accordance with Ontario Human Rights Code. Um, so I do want to share that uh, bit of information and that with combined, combined with the fact that 91% of our HWDSB staff have been compliant um, with uh, providing um, uh, proof of vaccination status or exemptions to date, I think um, strongly shows that um, Hamilton um, as a whole and also in particular education workers are um, 
uh, very much uh, on board with uh, doing their bit to to keep schools open and to keep um, students and, and each other um, staff safe. Um, I, I want to close by saying that the name of this motion is Enhanced COVID-19 Precautions. And that was named uh, specifically uh, to illustrate the fact that we we need to do everything that we can to keep our, our focus front and center on students, on staff, on their health and safety, and on keeping schools open. We do not want to repeat the year and a half that we had over, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we want to keep schools open. We want to keep a focus on student learning, on recovery, as well as on uh, mental health. And with that, when we look at the year that we've had, we cannot do it again. So we must do everything within our power to keep schools, schools open, to keep students and staff safe, um, and, and to keep that focus front and center. Um, I'll close uh, just by saying thanks, thank you again, and I sincerely appreciate everyone's thoughtful, discussion, everyone's thoughtful questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Johnstone. So I'll go to the vote. I will read each portion that we're voting on so everyone is clear. Um, for the first item, we're looking at item one in the notice of motion that HWDSB worked collaboratively with Hamilton's local public health unit, local partners, and HWDSB employee groups to develop a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination procedure that is grounded in education and supportive incentives. And that, A, requires all employees, trustees, service providers, and volunteers to provide proof of full vaccination against COVID-19 while adhering Left. to legislative privacy standards. B, requires any employee, trustee, or service provider who is not fully vaccinated to participate in an exemption process with approval where there is a legal obligation to accommodate. And C, for anyone who is not adhering to the procedure requirements by an established deadline, that staff develop appropriate steps, including limiting access to the physical environment at HWDSB. And D requires any employee, trustee, or service provider who has an approved formal exemption and is not vaccinated be accommodated and required to complete regular asymptomatic testing and demonstrate a negative test as per the recommendations by public health. So I'll turn to trustees and ask um, one, I did have someone leave, so I'm just going to go to the roll call to see who's present. First, and then we'll go to the vote. Uh, so just who's present, Trustee Bingham, are you still on the line? Yes, I'm still here. Thank you. Trustee Buck? Present. Thanks. Uh, Trustee Deeds? Trustee Deeds, are you still on the line? Join. Sorry, present. Yes, I was just having trouble getting the uh, mute off. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Deeds. Uh, Vice Chair Glendo? Just checking oh, that you're still on the line. Thank you. Trustee yeah, Johnstone? Present. Thank you. Trustee Miller? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Mulholland? Present. Thank you. Trustee Pekin Miller? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Trustee Tutt? Still here, Chair. Thank you. Student Trustee Mahmoud? Present. Thank you. Student Trustee Abdel Hafiz? Present. Thank you. And Sega Wanagalva dot KG. Sorry, KG. Present. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we have everyone except for Trustee Archer who had sent regret to the first item that I just read out in full. Um, is anyone opposed? If you're opposed, you can unmute yourself and indicate your name. Hi, Chair Dinko, this is Trustee Buck. Um, I'm opposed. Thank you. Trustee Buck, is anyone else opposed? Hearing none, item one passes. Uh, two, well, again, I'll read it just since we're not face-to-face. -face. That HWDSB exercise enhanced precautions for higher-risk school activities, including but not limited to wind instruments, singing, assemblies, and contact sports in school settings. Enhanced precautions can include limiting activities to outdoors, asymptomatic rapid testing for students and or bell covers or additional masking requirements for musical instruments. Is anyone opposed? Uh, Chair Dinko, this is Trustee Buck. Mm -hmm. uh, I am opposed. Thank you. Is anyone else opposed? Uh, 
Okay, hearing none, uh, that's Trustee Black opposed. Uh, everyone else in favor, that passes. Item three, that HWDSB review and consider reducing or waiving or subsidizing school fees for the 2021-22 school year and that staff approach the Hamilton Foundation student success uh, for possible support. Given that many Hamilton families have lost jobs and are facing financial hardships as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, is anyone opposed? Hearing none, thank you, that passes. Item four is that the chair write a letter to the local Chief Medical Officers of Health and Terry's Chief Medical Officer of Health and Minister of Education, affirming that the board supports COVID-19 vaccines be added to the list of compulsory vaccines or vaccinations under the Immunization of School Pupils Act for all eligible students, as advocated by the Ontario Public School Boards Association. Is anyone opposed? Chair Dingo, this is Trustee Buck. I'm opposed. Thank you, Trustee Buck. Is anyone else opposed to item four? I'm also opposed to this uh, point. It's Trustee Miller. Thank you, Trustee Miller. And is anyone else opposed? Thank you. Item four passes. Item five, that the chair write a letter to the local chief medical officers of health, Ontario's chief medical officer of health, and the minister of education and the minister of health, asking that they apply a first to open and last to close approach to school closures to protect public education to the greatest extent possible. For item five, is anyone opposed? Hearing none, that passes, and I'll just remind people to check that you're on mute. Um, I just have a little background noise that I can hear. Um, at this time, we are going to item eight then. Thank you, uh, trustees and student trustees. Uh, this resolution into committee of the whole private session as per the Education Act, section 207.2, B, the disclosure of an intimate personal or financial information in respect of a member of the board or committee an employee or prospective employee of the board or a pupil or his parent or guardian, or her parent or guardian, pardon me. Um, so I'll need a motion to move into committee of the whole. I will just uh, select someone, so Vice Chair Galindo, if you can do that, seconded by Trustee D. Is anyone opposed? Hearing none, I will invite uh, trustees to call or to go into the committee as a whole, but give us about five minutes to get set up. And uh, we will see their student trustees. I don't believe that you'll be coming into this part of the session, but I'll get that confirmed. Okay, and we will be back after committee as a whole um, to follow up in public session at a later time this evening. Thank you. Left. The chairperson has disconnected. The conference will now end. <laughs>